Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Discovery of Biomarkers Predictive of Anti-Cancer Drug Response in Preclinical Setting, presented by Dr. Benjamin Ebb Keynes, an assistant professor at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center at University of Toronto. I'm Dr. Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appear on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on that ask a question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Just click on that continuing education credits tab located on the top right hand corner of your presentation window and follow those processes for obtaining your credits. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Dr. Benjamin Ebb Keynes. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, Dr. Ebb Keynes. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, I'm very glad to speak about the research we do in the lab regarding the biomarker discovery from a uh, preclinical model system. So I'm Benjamin Ebb Keynes. I work at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center at University of Toronto. And today I'll discuss about the various ways to discover biomarkers for uh, cancer. So as you know, um, we are pretty good now at not only identifying the hallmarks of cancer in terms of pathways that are uh, relevant and sometimes essential for cancer to grow, but we're also pretty good at designing compounds to target those pathways. So uh, you could think of uh, the recent immunotherapy uh, to block uh, immunoresistance uh, or the PARP inhibitors, for instance. So we have this large portfolio of compounds and cancer hallmarks uh, that are the targets. However, we those those biomarkers, those therapies, sorry, um, only are only effective on a subset of the patients, uh, roughly around five to twenty percent of the set of, of the patient for the best therapies. So the big question is, how do we know? which therapy we should go, we should give to uh, each individual patient. And that's the whole premise for precision medicine. How do we match the drug for each individual patient coming to the clinic? And one way to do it is to better understand the genomic landscape of the patient tumors to predict for a given drug whether the patient would be uh, a responder or a non-responder. Here's the problem. So despite large investments in major cancer centers, only 18 to 39 percent of the patient actually benefit from this uh, rather expensive and time-consuming approach. And you can see here uh, four of the biggest studies, including uh, the impact compact uh, clinical trials in, at Princess Margaret. And you can see that the number, the proportion of patients for which we found an actionable genomic aberration, meaning that we could predict which drug could be very effective given an aberration observed in, in the patient tumor, and this proportion is rather low. For the vast majority, for the majority of patients, we cannot find any actionable uh, aberration in the patient tumor. And that is due to multiple factors. One of them is that usually for those uh, genotype matched clinical trials, we use very small sequencing uh, gene panel, uh, focus on mutations and copy number variations in protein coding genes. Uh, they, they usually range from uh, 50 uh, uh, oncogenes to up to 500. Um, and that obviously limits our ability to explore the genomic landscape of patient tumors. Uh, another problem, and maybe the main problem, is that we actually know very little about the relationship between the genomic aberration and the therapy response. Even if we see uh, um, genes, aberrations, genes that are mutated or genes that are deleted or amplified in a given patient tumors, uh, tumor, we cannot really predict uh, which drug would be the most efficient 
for most of the compounds that are used uh, even in clinical settings. So that's a major issue that uh, my lab is trying to uh, tackle uh, using um, preclinical data. So I'll go through the different uh, biological materials that uh, one could use for biomarker discovery. Uh, they're mainly uh, classified in three categories. The in situ uh, data, which is basically the patient tumor. The in vivo data, those are animal models, uh, including patient drug xenograft and genetically engineered mouse models. And the in vitro models that, are, uh, uh, that consist of uh, immortalized cancer cell lines, uh, 2D cell lines, um, as well as the, the newer model, uh, the 3D organoids uh, derived from patient uh, tumor cells. So each of those uh, um, samples or materials have uh, the pros and cons. So obviously, if you want to predict uh, a good biomarker, if you want to identify a, a new novel gene drug associations, uh, patient data are definitely the most relevant data to use. However, it's very hard to collect su such samples. You need, usually you need to do it in a clinical trial setting. You need to collect samples. You need to profile samples for the genomic preparation, and then you need to follow the patient uh, for their clinical outcome. There are many uh, uh, aspects that are problematic with this approach. Uh, not only you need, uh, um, you need to uh, follow uh, ethics principles, so it's, it could be limited when you want to uh, test uh, compounds that are not approved, obviously you cannot do it. Uh, so you're limited to approved drugs. Um, samples are by definition rare uh, for some disease, and even for uh, common disease, it's very costly and lengthy to organize a clinical trial. So even so, those, those uh, samples and, and resulting data are the most relevant, and uh, they're also the, the most difficult to uh, collect. If you go a little bit a, st a step further from patient tumors and you take patient materials and, and, and graph those tumor cells into an animal model, such as uh, a mouse model, then you can get uh, a good uh, model that will recapitulate somehow uh, partially the, the response in the patient. So it's not perfect. Those models uh, still um, lack uh, major components of, of the tumors in, in the patient, including uh, part of the microenvironment um, and uh, a functional um, uh, immune system. However, and they're also quite costly and lengthy uh, to, to use, so you can screen a few dozen drugs, but it's hard to screen a hundred drugs on a, on a thousand of those uh, animal models. So it's rather uh, medium, to, low to medium throughput. Uh, this platform, th those kind of samples are amenable for uh, low to medium throughput drug screening. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the in vitro models. So there is barely any ethical issues uh, using those. They're very cheap and high throughput uh, um, for our drug screening. We can use our robotic uh, platforms to screen hundreds of drugs on thousands of cell lines. Uh, and you can screen both approved and experimental drugs. So those are the advantages of, of the in vitro. However, they're pretty far away from the patient tumors. They actually lack many, many features of the tumors, including the stroma, including the functional immune system, but they're also growing in a very rich medium, which makes them, uh, which makes the response to therapy sometimes quite different from what is observed in the patients. However, we got uh, tons and tons of, of data uh, from those in vitro models. So the usual way to discover a biomarker is first to start in vitro, because it's cheap, because we can generate a lot of data. Then we go to preclinical trials, where we take some candidate biomarkers and test them uh, in a series of, in a cohort of animal models. And then finally, uh, we test those uh, 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 mark biomarkers that are been discovered in vitro, validated in animal models, and we finally test them in the patient with this one, two, and three uh, clinical trials. So I'm going to focus today on the biggest source of uh, data for uh, biomarkers in preclinical settings using those in vitro models. So you can imagine that uh, if you have a large panel of cancer cell lines um, or originating from a, a, a panel of, of tissue types, uh, you can provide those uh, immortalized cancer cell lines quite extensively. You have a lot of materials 
to uh, to use for uh, profiling. So um, people have already profiled the gene expression, the copy number variation, the uh, gene expression, methylation, protein abundance uh, for uh, all those cell lines. In addition to those uh, genomics data, you want to uh, profile those cell lines uh, pharmacologically. What you want to generate is what we call a drug dose response curve, where you test several concentrations of the drugs that's on the x-axis of the drug dose response curve, and you look at the cell viability on the y-axis, and you, you're looking for drugs that affect viability when concentrations increase. So here you see the red, uh, the green curve uh, on the top right. You can see that this green curve is actually a, a straight horizontal line, meaning that the drug is doing nothing uh, to affect. Uh, it doesn't uh, inhibit the growth of the cells. While the purple curve, you see that it's decreasing uh, with respect to increasing concentration. So this drug is definitely having some uh, growth inhibitory effect on that given cell line. So by combining the genomic data and the pharmacological data, that's how you can do the biomarker discovery. We call those data pharmacogenomics data as they combine both pharmacological profiles and genomic profiles. So if you consider that your genomics profiles are uh, labeled as X and uh, your drug dose response curves are actually the phenotypes to try to, try to predict uh, labeled as Y, the biomarker is actually this function of, of the genomics that allow you to predict the phenotype. So this function F of X is actually uh, your biomarker. It could be a univariate function uh, using only one mutation, let's say one copy number variation, or it could be uh, multivariate as well as multimodal. You could combine uh, gene expression and mutation and copy number variation, for instance, of, uh, of multiple genes. So what we knew uh, so far is that uh, those genomics data, not only they are very high dimensional, but dimensional uh, you have many, many genes that you can, for, for whom you, for who, whose you can measure uh, gene expression, uh, copy number variation mutation, for instance, but they're also quite noisy. So here you see uh, two examples. Um, one gene on the left side that is extremely inconsistent between t two studies. So GDSC stands for the genomic uh, drug sensitivity in cancer. Uh, it's a, a large drug screening data set from the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in UK. And the other one is the cancer cell line encyclopedia. Um, um, uh, for the and the genomics data have been generated at the Broad Institute, while um, the uh, pharmacological profiles, profiles have been generated by uh, Novartis in Boston. So here you can see that for the first gene on the left, uh, the gene expression actually uh, completely uncorrelated between the two data sets. And more striking is actually the fact that in GDSC, this gene is never expressed in a, in, in a pattern of hundreds of cell lines. While for the same cell lines in CCLE, you see a wide range of expression. And they both use the same microarray platform or very similar uh, affirmatrix chip. So you cannot really explain that by a bias in the technology. So there is really something in inherently uh, uh, noisy about, about uh, that gene in terms of gene expression. On the right side, on the other hand, you can see that between the two studies, not only the scale of the expression matches very closely, but you can also see that the two expressions are extremely correlated between the two data sets. So among the 25,000 protein coding genes, there are some genes that are extremely correlated and extremely robust across studies, while others are extremely uh, unstable and noisy. So that's something that was known, and that's something that we can somehow take into account when we do the biomarker discovery. What was less obvious, though, is the fact that the phenotype itself the drug response for a given cell line is actually the process of, it's actually the results of a very complex and noisy process. So there is a lot of noise in the phenotype, uh, phenotypic data as well. Here you can see uh, two examples of, of cell lines that are very uh, discordant curves uh, between GDSC and CCLA. So in one data set, the, the cell line is, is defined or is, is measured as being highly resistant while in the other data set is measured to be uh, quite sensitive. So in those cases, it's very hard for uh, a machine learning approach or a statistical approach to uh, identify the biomarkers if the status of the cell line in terms of sensitivity and resistance uh, suddenly switch between, uh, between studies. 
So that's something that is not um, uh, very well uh, known in the field. And in statistics and machine learning, even so we're pretty good at dealing with the noise in the input features, it's actually hard to deal with uh, noise in the output or the phenotypic uh, features. So this field is actually a very, very active field with a lot of uh, data being shared uh, uh, over the years. It all started with the uh, NCI 60 uh, panel of 60 cell lines uh, as part of the drug uh, developmental therapeutic program at the NCI, where they screened these small panel cell lines for uh, an insanely large number of drugs, up to uh, 200,000 compounds with uh, uh, at least 60,000 drugs for which uh, high quality data are available. And you can see that Japan followed with their own uh, uh, NCI 60 live program um, and, and a series of other data sets that have been published along the years, uh, either from pharma companies or, 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 or uh, research institutes like the Wellcome Trust Singer Institute or uh, the Broad Institute in Boston. So it's a very active field. We have access to a lot of data. And because uh, people use the Myrtle Lysonides that are commercially available, we actually have a lot of overlap across those different studies, which opens a uh, very interesting uh, avenue of research when it comes to uh, training and validate um, biomarkers, as well as looking at consistency across data sets. Even so, those data have been shared uh, to the best ability of, of the data generators or the authors of the papers. It's actually, there is no consensus uh, in terms of some of the basic elements of those pharmacogenics data. For instance, uh, cell lines um, um, can be identified using uh, different names, and there is no standardized nomenclature for uh, cancer cell lines, for instance. So we, use, we decided to make the cell line, the cell line identifier identifiers consistent across data set using uh, a new, relatively new platform called Sorosaurus, which is a very extensive and comprehensive database of uh, cell line um, annotations. So from this, we could rename the cell lines uh, consistently across data set to maximize the overlap. Even so, uh, if you think that a cell line, cell line could be tricky to curate, you should definitely take a look at the drug identifiers. It's even harder. Uh, nobody really agreed on the way to identify drugs in those data set, whether people sometimes use the uh, uh, brand, uh, brand name or the company name or the molecule, the molecule uh, name. So we decided to take all those drugs and manually annotate them using uh, well-established classifiers, such as the PubChem identifier, the Inchi key, the Kembo, uh, all the SMILES, the structure of, of the compound. Uh, to, and that allowed us to do uh, not only uh, exact matching across data sets, but also fuzzy matching to see whether uh, some compounds could be very similar and be considered as chemical replicates. So it was a very tedious process of curation uh, and adaptation that took us more than uh, four years in the lab. But now we built a resource called PharmacoGX uh, that allows for, it's a computational platform for pharmacogenics and meta-analysis. So we not only build a software package, but also um, really software environments or virtual machines uh, with all the dependencies uh, for the platform, as well as a, a, a more recent web application to allow people to easily mine those data. So we present those uh, resources uh, in the next few slides, and we hope that this series of software tools could really help the community better mine those uh, large-scale uh, pre-clinical pharmacogenics data sets to do better biomarker discovery in the future. So PharmacoGX first, um, it's an R package that's available on Bioconductor and has been published in 2016 in Bioinformatics. And the idea is that uh, we downloaded all the genomics data, we processed them with very similar pipelines. Um, then we did the same, we did the same thing with the uh, uh, drug response data. That was a little bit more difficult because the, each study would release the the bio, the cell line viability with respect to concentration uh, measurements in a different way. So we had, there was a lot of work to do to build a script for each study. But the most important part is actually to merge those two data, the data sources, the, the genomics data, as well as the pharmacological data, and use the same annotations uh, across uh, all, the, all the pieces of data, uh, which means that we created the cell line name as well as, as the drug names 
So they, they were all consistent across different studies. The beauty is that you don't have to care about this anymore. Um, you can directly download the fully curated uh, object that contains all those pieces of data that have been checked for, for integrity. So we call it a, a pharmacoset or pset of, uh, uh, short. So you can download that, that data set I know you, we, we provide in projects a series of convenient uh, functions to, to do very basic analysis, such as uh, plotting the drug dose response curve, modeling and summarizing the drug dose response curve with something like IC50, which is the concentration you need to um, inhibit 50% of, of cell growth, or the, a, or the AAC, the area about the drug dose response curves as a summary of the resistance or sensitivity phenotype for a given sunlight. We also have function to easily extract the gene expression to, to average the replicates. So finally, you get all the matrices, all the data you need to, for your biomarker discovery pipeline. We also provide basic functions to do univariate biomarker discovery, controlling for tissue type, as well as batch, uh, batch effects in, in those data sets. So those are very basic function to uh, explore and, and do basic analysis uh, uh, from those data sets. However, uh, many of our collaborators were, are not uh, very computationally savvy, so they don't really like the idea of uh, studying our uh, terminal, studying our session to uh, mine those data sets. So we decided to build a, a website, a web application, to allow users to easily mine those data. Uh, we know I have seven data sets in there that um, uh, contains uh, more than 1,600 unique sun lines and, and more than half a million and drug dose response curves. So those data are pretty massive, but because they have been created carefully now, you can look at those data uh, in a unified way. So if you go on pharmacodb.ca, you can type a cell line name or a drug name or a combination of a cell line and a drug, and you'll see uh, different uh, types of information available from, uh, from those uh, big pharmacodynamics data sets. So I'll go through some of the functionalities here. So if you type a, a cell line name, such as A4, A549, which is a lung cancer cell line, you can directly see uh, in which studies those cell lines have been used. So we have seven studies, some, um, some from the Broad Institute, the Wellcome Trust, those are the biggest ones, but also for some, from, from some pharmaco companies, such as Novartis or Genentech. And you can see that here, for instance, this cell line has been extensively screened in, in a project or uh, a study called CTRPD2, which is a cancer uh, response cell uh, pretty portal at the Broad Institute. It has been screened for, uh, for more than 500 uh, uh, drugs. If you type a drug on the other hand, uh, such as AZD6244, which is a, a MEK inhibitor from AstraZeneca, you can see that this drug has been also screened in many uh, multiple studies, and you can see the number of cell lines that have been screened against that drug uh, in each study. So those are valuable uh, uh, information to know which data set uh, might be the most interesting for you. Now, the most interesting part is when you start typing a cell line name and a drug name. So what happens then is that you have, uh, in one click, you have access to uh, all the drug dose response curves for that specific uh, pair of drug and cell line in multiple studies. So here, it's a very typical example of curves that are not particularly consistent across studies. So you can see that uh, depending on the studies, you have a, a wide range of sensitivity with uh, one of the replicates uh, of GDSC uh, claiming that that cell line is very, very sensitive to uh, uh, the MEK inhibitor, while the other replicates actually uh, claim that this cell line is uh, quite resistant. And you can see that um, the uh, replicates for CGRP2 are a bit closer to each other, but still quite a bit of discrepancy, and the CCLE data set is an overtis pharmacological data um, report somewhat an intermediate sensitivity. So uh, many of the curves are consistent, some are inconsistent. That's an example of inconsistent uh, curves. But the tool really allow you to uh, obs um, observe all the studies at once to assess yourself uh, the consistency of, of those uh, pharmacological data. So another uh, aspect of the study um, um, is that you can easily uh, access uh, what we call summary statistics. So those are uh, basically summarization matrix of the drug dose response curves. So here you can see that we uh, pre-computed 
the area above the drug dose response curve, the IC50, the EC50, the EINF, and, and other matrix that have been uh, published. So that, that resource has been published in Nuclear Data Research last year, and it's freely available, so you can uh, go in there, download the data uh, you're interested in, and explore uh, seven uh, large-scale pharmacogenics data sets. So the beauty of the curation is that um, you, we can actually look at many of the studies at once and understand what, what's, the, what's the overlap across those studies. So for instance, if you look at the cell lines overlap across um, five data sets, you can see that there are, there are at least two or 300 drugs that has been screened in four data sets. So this plot is called an upset plot, and it basically reports uh, any kind of, of overlap for, uh, for a given set of studies represented by uh, the dark dots uh, at the bottom. So 300 cell lines screening for data, so that's quite an impressive number uh, to look at consistency, for instance. And same goes for, uh, for the drugs. If you look at uh, drugs that are being screened in uh, multiple studies, you can see that there are seven drugs that are actually screening all the data sets. So again, a lot of chemical, a lot of replicates for those chemical perturbations across multiple independent studies, which makes it very interesting uh, for biomarker discovery. However, as I said, um, uh, my, we, we, we have spent quite a bit of time to uh, look at the consistency of those data, both at a genomic level as well as a pharmacological level. And you may have, uh, you may have seen this, this paper published in 2013 and the follow-up paper published in, in 2016 where uh, we actually uh, set to uh, compare two of the biggest studies, CCL and GDSC, uh, to quantitatively assess uh, the consistency of those data set. And you can guess that uh, from the title that the data were are surprisingly inconsistent. So if you take all the um, the uh, replicates, the biological replicates within uh, within those studies, and if you compute the AAC, the area above the drug dose response curves, and you compute the difference between AAC uh, across replicates, you end up with, with a distribution like this where a lot of the replicates have actually very, very uh, small um, delta AAC, which is very good because it means that the replicates were very, very consistent. However, there was, there was a, a small proportion of, of replicates that, that filled in the sense that the, the difference in AAC is pretty large. So if you, if you look at this distribution and you see a delta AAC greater than 0 0.2, it's actually an uh, indication that it's unlikely to come to come up from a replicate. If the delta AC is more than 0 0.2, it's indicative that uh, the, the drug dose response uh, curves are quite different. Um, so if we do that um, for all the replicates that we have in, in uh, our PharmacoDB web application, you can see that um, there is in globally there is quite uh, uh, the data are quite consistent across the replicates. So here we decided to use two metrics. Um, to assess the consistency. One is called the CI, the concurrence index. What it does, it takes every pair of, of cell lines and see whether um, two studies or two replicates could rank the cell lines the same way. So the, it's, it's a generalization of the area under the rock curve. So here you can see that the concurrence index uh, for all the replicates across the study um, is estimated around uh, 0 0.74. Uh, we expect a congruence index of 0 0.8 to be um, to represent a, a, a consistent data. So here we're a little bit below, which is which is a bit disappointing. So we decided to dig into the nature of the data and see how we can deal with the noise and increase that uh, that consistency. And we came up with uh, what we call the MCI, the modified congruence index, that actually take into account the noise in the assay to increase the consistency of the data. So I will explain. Uh, in the next slide, uh, what MCI is exactly. But you can already see here that if you apply this new matrix, uh, then you get uh, a consistency, a concurrence across uh, um, around 0 0.99, which is what we expected from those high quality uh, pharmacological profiling data. So what is MCI? So imagine that you have two replicates, uh, and on the x-axis you have uh, the area under the uh, the area about the drug dose response curve for replicate one, and you have the same on the y-axis for replicate two. In the ideal world, 
uh, those AAC would perfectly align on the diagonal. That would be a perfect replication of, of the experiment. However, there is noise in those assays, so you can imagine that you end up with a with a, a, a figure, a scalar ball like this. Then I would consider uh, that the pharmacological world would consider uh, uh, quite a successful uh, replication experiment, meaning that the three sunlights that are highly resistant, they're, they're uh, on the bottom uh, left, while the two sunlights that are uh, highly sensitive are, are on the top right of the scalar plot. However, if you look at the compliance index, comparing every pair of sunlights, you only get a compliance index of 0 0.6, which is very, very close to the random case of 0 0.5. And the, the reason for this is that uh, when you do the concurrence index, even so you can numerically order the sunlights that are highly resistant, the noise in the assay is such that if you redo the experiment, um, the one that was slightly more resistant than the other one could just switch the order. So in that case, the, the assay is not, uh, it's not accurate, it's not robust enough to uh, make those, uh, to observe those, measure those subtle differences in, in the resistance phenotype. However, the assay is very good at discriminating uh, highly resistant versus highly sensitive. So we decided to modify the conference index to basically discard the pairs that are extremely close in terms of AC. And if you remember the last plot, we found that 95% uh, of the replicates had a delta AC less than 0 0.2. So we decided to basically exclude all the pairs of sunlines that had a delta AC less than 0 0.2, which by default uh, discard uh, all the pairs involving two resistance sunlight. So if you do this, then you see that the uh, concurrence index is jumping from uh, increasing from 0 0.6 to 0 0.86, which is much more reasonable uh, for this uh, replicated experiment. So now that we kind of fix the way we look at consistency across data set, uh, we actually redo our initial analysis that we published in Nature and uh, looked at the uh, increasing consistency. In the blue, uh, with the blue bars, you can see that that's the traditional concurrence index. That's what we published in 2013 and 2016. However, with this new concurrence index, you can see that the uh, concurrence across data set um, drastically improved with the, the majority of the drugs now uh, crossing this um, uh, arbitrary cutoff of 0 0.8 that represent high consistency across studies. So basically, what happens here is that most of the inconsistency happens in those pairs where the drug dose response pairs are very close to each other. And it doesn't make sense to uh, numerically order them or look at their correlation. However, if you look, focus on the bigger difference, then those studies tend to agree much more. So that, um, that is obviously very important when you, when you look at consistency across studies, however, uh, it may not really matter much. At the end of the day, we uh, generated those data to find biomarkers. So we decided to use this new matrix, the modified concurrence index, to see whether we could find uh, some of the non-biomarkers that are used in the clinic. We have a series here of around 15 uh, non-biomarkers. So those are gene drug associations that are being uh, that are clinically approved, that have been tested in clinical setting. Um, and some others are treating uh, drug association that have been validated again and again uh, in, in preclinical settings. So you can see here that uh, with the uh, modified compress index, we can actually find more than half of those gene drug association, while with the more traditional compress index, we could only find 20% of those. So there is a, a drastic improvement in our ability to find non-clinically approved gene drug association. So it actually matters a lot when you do biomarker discovery to make sure that not only you take into account the noise in the uh, uh, genomics data, but also the noise in the pharmacological data. Thanks to uh, our PharmacoGX platform, um, including many, many data sets, now we can do meta-analysis, which means that we don't have to uh, uh, limit ourselves to the analysis of a single data set. We can actually combine many data sets to do more robust biomarker discovery. So here is an example of uh, a non-biomarker, which is ERBB2 gene expression um, uh, as a predictive biomarker of sensitivity to lapatinib. And you can see here that if you compute the MCI, which is represented by uh, the big square, uh, as well as its confidence interval represented by the horizontal line crossing the square, 
you can see that uh, the MCI is actually pretty high uh, for that for that biomarker with a uh, with an MCI around 0 0.72. So again, it's a non-biomarker, so we expect it to see a strong signal. However, uh, we can actually see uh, how the different data sets behave for this non-biomarker. And interestingly, you can see here that the gray study uh, have a very had a very high uh, concurrence index, almost 0 0.9, while the uh, CTRPV2 study had a much lower concurrence index, uh, also still significant. And the reason is very simple. Uh, ERBB2 uh, is a very good biomarker in breast cancer. So lapatinib is a, is a drug to, to, uh, used to treat ERBB2 positive, ER2 positive breast cancer, breast tumors. And GRAY is a, is a breast cancer data set, so it's composed of 80 uh, breast cancer cell lines, while CTRPV2 is a very uh, large pan cancer data set that includes actually uh, much less uh, ER2 positive breast cancer cell lines. So that's the reason why in some data set the biomarker is very weak and some others the biomarker could be very strong. So it starts, the meta-analysis meta using from our projects would also allow you to better investigate the nature of those data sets. So we also, um, so ERBB2 was a non-biomarker, so we wanted to find a new biomarker. So here we discovered that uh, ORC1, uh, the gene ORC1, the expression of the gene ORC1 is actually a pretty good predictor of sensitivity to bifidaxel. So the MCA is a little bit lower than uh, than for ERBB2, for instance, no, the, the MCA is around 0, uh, 0 0.62. However, still highly significant. Uh, we don't, there is no known biomarker for bactylitaxel, so uh, that could be an interesting candidate. However, as you can see, um, there is one data set with, where this biomarker is actually not predictive at all of bactylitaxel sensitivity, and that's the GDSC 1000 data set. Interestingly, GDSC is, is the, the only data set in our collection that using uh, the CYTO60 uh, pharmacological assay to assess drug response. So it's based on the amount of DNA in the cells. So the amount of DNA in the cells are, uh, is used to um, as a surrogate for cell viability, while all the other assays are using the, the ATP generation as a, as a surrogate of cell viability. So here it could be that this gene, uh, that the relationship of drug sensitivity depends on the way you assess uh, the viability of the cells. Um, and it may actually fill uh, when you count the amount of DNA. So maybe the, the, the growth inhibition process is slightly different uh, uh, in the case of paclitaxel, and the choice of assay is actually uh, very important. So again, that's an example how you can investigate the nature of the data set by looking at your meta-analysis results. So we wanted to go further than just gene expression, mutation, and copy number variation. So with our large uh, compendium of, data, of pharmacogenomics data, we decided to focus on uh, the most recent uh, data set, uh, RNA sequencing data set that have been released um, in the last few years, uh, namely from the Wellcome Trusting Institute, uh, G uh, Genentech, uh, from uh, uh, the Drawberry Laboratory, uh, as well as uh, CCLE. So we had a large amount of, of uh, RNA data to mine, and we decided that that instead of focusing on the overall gene expression, we would like to look at the expression of each individual transcript for, for genes. So as you know, alternative splicing um, is responsible for uh, the, the uh, expression of many isoforms uh, for specific genes. Um, and we were wondering whether the expression of individual transcript could actually uh, form a better class of biomarkers compared to uh, overall gene expression, that's kind of an average of the expression of all the isoforms. And even so, with uh, uh, microarray data, it's very hard to um, quantify the expression of uh, specific isoforms. RNA-seq is, provi is providing you a, a very good platform uh, with a very good platform to, to do so. So we use those high-quality RNA-seq data to estimate the expression of each individual, individual isoforms and uh, correlate them with drug sensitivities. That's a paper we published last, last year in uh, uh, nature communications. So the study design uh, is the following: because we had so many data sets, we wanted to do a, uh, we wanted to keep a lot of data for uh, for an independent validation. So the way we did it was to use CCLE and GDSC uh, as a combined uh, training set. So we did meta analysis 
find on biomarkers and cancer uh, across uh, CCLA and GDSC. Then we decided to validate those pan-cancer biomarkers using another large data set published by Genentech, the GCSI, the Genentech um, Cell Line um, Screening Initiative, and uh, we validated part of those biomarkers there. We also decided to use our sets of um, evidence profiles of breast cancer cell lines, both from a drug laboratory as well as a private data set that has been released in this paper uh, from the University Health Network. And we decided and we validated part of, uh, of the candidate biomarkers in breast cancer cell lines specifically. So I'll, I'll summarize all the results into one, one figure that uh, I found uh, particularly representative of what's happening here uh, in terms of the quality of the biomarkers. So in red, you have the, uh, the number of isoform biomarkers that have been discovered in the train set and validated in the pan cancer uh, validation set, a completely independent uh, data set. Uh, in blue, you have the biomarkers that are gene-specific, meaning that only the overall gene expression uh, uh, is predictive of drug sensitivity and is validated. Um, if a biomarker could be predictive both at the isoform level as well as uh, the, G, the overall gene expression level, then we uh, denote that those biomarkers in, in purple. And you can see that for uh, the, the few drugs that were in common between CCL, GDSC, and Genentech, uh, you can see that the, the, the majority of the isoform specific biomarkers uh, got properly validated in this independent data set. And there are a few validated biomarkers uh, that are both validated at the isoform level and overall gene expression level. However, there are very little gene specific uh, biomarkers that got validated in, in the Genentech data set. So that's basically telling you that uh, isoform uh, uh, expression is actually a very good uh, a source of biomarkers for drug response is actually a better source biomarker than overall gene expression, which is usually which is used in the vast majority of our medical students nowadays. So we here we propose um, uh, isoforms as as a better source of biomarkers for drug sensitivity. Um, another aspect of uh, our work is not only to aggregate and 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 create and release data for. Uh, for cancer research, but also try to bring the results of those analyses uh, much closer to the clinic. So the goal here is to basically take the biomarkers that we found to be robust across multiple studies in the cancer cell lines and give that information back to the clinician when they look at the, the aberrations in the patient tumor. So it's basically um, connecting the first slice of my presentation where I showed that a lot of those patients have no actionable uh, aberration, so we don't know what to do with the aberration we see uh, in, their, in their tumors, and connect that, that, in, th that information with the results of our preclinical pharmacogenics and biomarker discovery pipelines. So here we decided to use CBioPodal as a platform to connect um, those preclinical biomarkers with the clinical observations. CBioPortal, as you may know, is a, is a very widely used uh, platform uh, to explore genomic aberrations, uh, mostly mutation and CNV. You can also explore uh, gene expression uh, in that platform. Uh, it contains TCGA, all the major data set, TCGA, the cancer cell line uh, uh, encyclopedia, uh, the, the GTEx uh, uh, data. And you can actually look at the different genes across patients, or you can focus on a given patient and look at the different genomic aberrations. Here, it's an example of a male uh, breast cancer patient where there is a series of amplification uh, that have been observed in that patient. And luckily, luckily this patient has the ERBB2 amplification. Uh, this is a non-biomarker, so we know that um, if the patient gives, uh, treat that patient with lapatinib, which is a EGFR ERBB2 inhibitor, um, that patient is very likely to respond. So that's that's an example where there is an action, actionable aberration. Uh, however, uh, most of the time there is no such uh, aberration. And that's where um, we plan to add another icon on CBioPortal that would report whether that aberration, could it, could it be um, a mutation, a copy number aberration on the or gene expression, 
uh, is associated with drug response in our large uh, panel of cancer cell lines. So you can imagine that you see this very uh, this uh, little pill uh, icon, and you could click on it and get information about uh, the drugs uh, that are associated with that with that generic aberration. So here again, we took this very simple example of ERBB2 lapatinib. Uh, we have two uh, ERBB2 inhibitors in our uh, data sets. They're both associated with ERBB2 gene expression and amplification. So the, if that association was not uh, known um, by um, um, by the clinicians, then uh, the clinician he or she could access uh, this uh, the pharmacodb resource and get this additional uh, piece of evidence to help him or her um, decide upon the treatment of, 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 of the cancer patient. However, the major limitation of this approach is that, as, as, as I said earlier, uh, cancer cell lines don't fully recapitulate uh, the drug response of uh, cancer patients. And I presented the in vivo model as a, as a better uh, preclinical model to model uh, um, drug response. However, because of, of, um, the, the, uh, because of the cost and the, the length of, of those uh, animal studies, we, you cannot really screen very large amount of drugs. So, however, if you want to validate a few candidate biomarkers, it's actually a platform of choice before you move to the clinic. So, we are, are now investigating um, existing uh, in vivo pharmacogenics data sets. And what we observed, obviously, is that um, tumor growth curves are very noisy. It's very similar to the drug dose response curves. They also, um, the source of an experiment that's quite complex to implement and um, that could also uh, be quite uh, noisy. So here you see actually a pretty good example where uh, the control is growing quite uh, fast uh, with the time on the x-axis and uh, the uh, tumor volume on the y-axis while the, the treatment of that drug is actually very effective and, and you see uh, stable disease or even uh, regression of the disease. Uh, however, a lot of the curves are much uh, noisier than that. So uh, very similar to the in vitro pharmacogenomics data, you're going to have to take into account the noise in the in vivo pharmacogenomics data. So we decided to implement uh, a platform very similar to um, pharmacogx. It's called Zima. Uh, for xenograft uh, evaluation of drug response. Um, so you can see that the, the experimental design is actually quite uh, more complicated than uh, for the cancer cell lines that are already established that you can buy from uh, commercial vendors. Here you're gonna have, most people will have to uh, generate their own PDX or they're gonna have to access uh, PDXs from uh, other sources like the Jackson Lab for instance. Um, propagate, uh, generate enough materials, enough uh, mouse uh, with the tumor growing to finally uh, do some of the control and, and drug treatment experiments. And obviously, you could also provide the patient tumors as well as the PDX of different passages uh, to, uh, to get a sense of the stability of the genomic operations. And very similar to the cell, to the cell line uh, data, you can uh, compare the genomics data uh, from the mouse models to the phenotypic data, which is the tumor growth curves uh, for control and treatment. So that's a source, um, that's, a, uh, that's a resource that uh, we are currently developing. Uh, it, it is now publicly available, but uh, we are going to push a paper on BioArchive very soon. However, you can still, uh, you can already access and give it a try. So it's an R package that will be submitted to bioconductors, so very similar to PharmacoGX. It stores curated um, um, PDX, patient-derived xenograft data and drug response, and provides a convenience function to uh, analyze those data. So there is one data set we're very, uh, uh, we are particularly interested in, it's called the uh, Novartis PDX Encyclopedia. It's a very large uh, data set of a thousand, around a thousand uh, patient-derived xenograft treated with uh, a few dozens of drugs. And they use a very uh, uh, particular uh, design called the one by one by one. So instead of doing replicates for each uh, control and treatment arms, they actually do only one control and one um, one mouse per uh, per drug. So obviously it has its limitation. However, using that design, they were able to screen a very large number of uh, patient-derived xenographs from multiple tissue types. 
So as I said, it's very similar to PharmacoGX where you have the molecular data as well as the tumor growth um, data, and you have a series of functions to uh, assess drug response and, and do basic biomarker discovery. So the, the type of phenotypic the pharmacological profiles in the EP4 pharmacogenomics data is quite different. Uh, we are not uh, dealing with drug dose response curves uh, anymore. Uh, it's usually one concentration of the drugs, and you monitor the tumor growth uh, over time. And there are multiple ways to assess the sensitivity of a given uh, xenograph to, to a, a specific drug. Uh, for instance, you can look at the uh, area between uh, the curves. You can look at the angle, which is quite similar. Um, but Novartis introduced uh, a modified resist criteria, which is what we used. Uh, the resist criteria are, uh, are what we used in the clinic to assess uh, the clinical response of a patient. They modified it for, uh, for the mouse models. So it's based on the best running average uh, response uh, between uh, one of, of a single curve. So for instance, if you have the control here, it would be called a progressive disease um, as it should. And for this treatment, it's actually a partial response uh, of the patient. Um, and they have like four categories, including progressive disease, stable disease, partial response, and complete response, very similar to the resistance criteria but for mouse models. We're also in the process of um, developing new summarization matrix, um, including well-established ones, such as the tumor growth inhibition, TGI, uh, as well as new ones, such as the uh, method calls on, uh, based on Gaussian process modeling and linear mix models that require replicate, so it's not amenable to the Novartis uh, uh, studies where there is only one curve available for controls and uh, each trick and drug treatment. Despite the limitation of this of this experimental design, the, the amount of data is pretty massive. So here, this is just a heat map of the uh, modified resist criteria for all the PDXs, all the breast cancer PDXs, for all the compounds and combination of compounds that have been created in that study. So you can already see that those data are pretty rich. And, um, and the amount of risk, however, one of the challenge in those uh, PDX drug screening is that the amount of complete response and partial response is actually pretty low. Uh, and that's the rational with the one by one by one experimental design is that you need to screen a very large number of PDXs to have enough responses to, uh, to biomarker discovery. So they kind of uh, traded uh, um, robustness of the assay um, against uh, the number of PDXs uh, they, could, they could screen. So we are now investigating those, uh, those data to see whether we can validate some of our uh, biomarkers discovered in, in uh, cancer cell lines in the PDXs. But as you can imagine, it's a, it's a very uh, time-consuming work, and uh, the number of responses being so low, it's actually hard to get a, a strong statistical signal from the data. So in summary, um, I showed you that there are actually many uh, in vitro pharmacogenomics data sets that are available. Um, and, and the people have been very good at sharing their pharmacogenomics data uh, uh, on, uh, over the years. Um, and you can do tissue specific as well as uh, pan cancer specific, uh, pan cancer meta analysis uh, to discover robust biomarkers. So it's really, with PharmacoGX, it's one of the few platforms that allows you to look for biomarkers that validate across multiple data sets, uh, which really rise the confidence. Of, uh, with respect to those biomarkers. You can also now integrate pharmacogenomics from a multiple source of data. Um, you can combine uh, mutation, copy number variation, and gene expression, and we are now integrating methylation as well, as well as uh, protein abundance. Uh, we also release quality controls as well as, as new annotation to make sure that those signs and drugs are properly annotated. So in, in summary, the resources we've built in the lab for uh, for biomarker discovery in preclinical settings or pharmacogx uh, that enables univariate and multivariate biomarkers across multiple uh, data sets. PharmacoDB that allows you to very easily mine those data sets in terms of cell lines and drugs and drug dose response curves as well as a biomarker. So uh, we actually uh, added um, the univariate gene expression biomarkers in PharmacoDB and we are in the process of expanding that list with mutation copy number variation. And I think very interestingly in the future, we want to fuse 
see by both on InformacoDB to allow clinicians to easily access uh, the results of the meta-analysis done in PharmacoDB. And the hope is that um, instead of uh, matching uh, less than 50%, less than 40% of the patient to uh, clinical trials testing various uh, targeted therapies, we will be able to match up to 70 to 80% of those patients and really increase their return on investment based on those large scale clinical pharma trials data. Uh, another platform we are still developing is Exiva for uh, large scale in vivo drug screening experiment. And hopefully that will be uh, published uh, this year. So um, at the end, I would like to uh, emphasize again the uh, importance of research reproducibility uh, in all the biomedical field, but in particular in, in pharmacogenics. Um, the data are extremely complex with different uh, sources of data both genomics and, and pharmacological, but also in terms of analysis pipeline. If so, it's good to know uh, uh, and annotate the data, know the source of the data and annotate the data correctly, but it's equally important to actually know exactly how the data have been processed and what kind of quality control and normalization procedures have been applied. Uh, and in that context, um, there are a few things we can do to improve reproducibility of our research on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, sharing data and let and metadata to let other people scrutinize the data and leverage the data in multiple ways and uh, uh, help uh, us to uh, discover whether there are whether there are errors in those data and fix them. Sharing the code to make sure that uh, it's very well understood how it's well understood and well documented how the data have been processed and how the analysis have been done. So not only people could um, uh, find errors and potentially fix them, but also they could reuse the code for uh, uh, other applications. Um, ideally, share those uh, this code in well-documented, easy-to-install uh, software packages, um, and ideally also not only provide the package, but the full software environment for people to easily deploy uh, the platform and, and test the code uh, with only a few clicks. And in, um, it's very time-consuming to do so, um, but it's definitely worth doing for many aspects, um, both in industry and academia. It makes uh, people to uh, onboard faster uh, in the lab because they have access to all the data, all the code they can learn uh, faster. It's easy to integrate feedback from colleagues in the community or other groups within a company as uh, they can look at the code and, and, and find, potentially find mistakes or improve the code. Um, it's also in the academic field actually makes you e it makes it easier to review your paper when you receive those uh, reviewers, reviewers comments after six months sometimes it's hard to get back um, and to the data and the analysis and update those uh, and it definitely improve the dissemination of your research output as people could reuse the data and the code uh, and in that aspect I'm a co-founder of the uh, MAPC society the massive analysis and quality control uh, society and uh, where whose mission is really to promote uh, reproducibility and data sharing in biomedical sciences. So I would like to uh, thank many people in the lab who have been uh, uh, crucial and essential in the development of those platforms, um, including, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Peter Smirnov, Charlie Safikani, uh, um, Annie Madani, and, and so on. It's, it's the results of a very large uh, team, as well as uh, external collaborators that have helped uh, not only providing data, but also integrating the data and uh, help us build uh, analysis pipelines that were relevant. So I uh, thank you for your attention and welcoming any questions. Thank you, Dr. Eb Keynes, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your questions into that box that appear on the screen and click the send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's take a look at some of our questions from our viewers. Dr. Ed Keynes, what is the best pharmacological assay should one use for a large scale drug screening study and how many replicates? So that, that's a very good question, uh, and there is no good answer to that one. Um, the point is, you have to make trade-offs when you do a very large-scale um, drug screening. 
and you have to use assets that are uh, fairly simple to implement uh, using Wildbox. So for the moment, there are two main assets that are being used, the site 260 and the subtitle Glio. They look at different aspects of, of uh, what makes uh, uh, cell viable. And the only, the, only, um, um, the only parameters that you should really look at is um, how robust in the assay when you implement it. Um, you have to do uh, multiple replicates. Uh, I suggest three to uh, six replicates for, uh, for a specific drug screening experiment to first tune the platform in a way that uh, you, can, uh, you can get reliable cell viability measurements for some of the uh, drugs known to be either inactive or very active for, for given cell lines. Um, the problem with the choice of a pharmacological assay is that depending on the cell lines and depending on the drugs, the mechanism of action could actually influence the way you want to look at uh, viability. And when you do very large scale uh, drug screening uh, uh, studies, you don't really have this, this uh, flexibility. So in, in, in a sense, it really depends on your need. It really depends on your, on the drugs and the mechanism of action that you want to investigate. And um, the goal is really to do enough replicates at least early on to tune the platform and get reliable um, cell viability measurements. Thank you for that, Dr. Ed Kane. And besides the PharmacoDB, are there other computational resources to mine large pharmacogenomic data sets? Um, so there are multiple um, platforms that have been developed along the years. Um, some of the web portal uh, from um, the Broad Institute and Welcome uh, Trust Sanger Institute are actually very interesting. They provide um, additional analysis tools that are now available in PharmacoDB and PharmacoGX. So if you go on the CCLE Broad Portal or the GDSC Sanger Portal, you will have access to uh, those uh, visualization and analysis tools. However, PharmacoGX and PharmacoDB are the only uh, platforms that uh, merge uh, uh, a large number of, of data set, up to seven uh, until now. Uh, but I encourage users to investigate tools that have been published by uh, the lab from uh, Julio Sáez Rodriguez uh, using the GDSC uh, um, data set, for instance, or uh, a recent tool released by the Cell Miner uh, team. Um, I think it's called the Cell Miner DB uh, uh, tool. So there are there. Are, there are multiple uh, tools uh, doing various aspects of the analysis, and depending on the analysis you want to do, you may want to explore and select the tools that are more relevant. Thank you. And Dr. Epkins, will new cancer models such as patient-derived organoids provide a better platform for biomarkers discovery? Indeed, there are. Um, many new cancer models that are being created um, to better mimic um, drug response in patients. And, and those are very important initiatives. As, as we know, the cancer cell lines, even so they are very amenable for high throughput drug screening, they also uh, have a lot of um, factors that make them, that make them um, behave differently than a tumor in the patient body. So, um, Patient-derived organoids is basically the latest iteration of, of uh, improving cancer models. Uh, those are um, tumor cells growing uh, as steroids, um, recapitulating, recapitulating sometimes part of the stroma uh, that was uh, active in the patient tumors. And uh, recent studies have been shown that those models recapitulate better uh, what's happening in the, in the patient body. So. No, the question is, how do we make those more sophisticated in vitro models amenable for a large scale drug response? And that's actually uh, uh, the work. Uh, there is a lot of work done in that space, um, and mainly from uh, Matthew Garnett at the Wellcome Trust Center Institute, who's working on a large uh, drug screening uh, platform for patient derived organoids. So the future looks very bright. Uh, we are going to have large scale pharmacogenomics data with better models. Uh, that hopefully will help us uh, identify better biomarkers of drug response. Dr. Epkane, thank you again for your presentation and for your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. 
Before we go, I wanna remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January, 2019. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.